5.1 probability rules. Let's go over some of our key terms. Probability is the likelihood of an occurrence and it deals with experiments that yield random short-term results yet reveal long-term predictability. So we can do an experiment and find the probability of something occurring and then apply that um, to some kind of long-term predictability. For example, um, when we study the effects of certain medications, we usually use a, a smaller group of subjects um, to conduct our experiment, but then we can say, okay, now for everyone who's going to use this medication, here are the effects um, uh, for everybody um, for, for a long period of time. Outcomes are really just another word for results. The, the, the outcomes, the results that happen when you run the experiment. And an experiment is any process with uncertain results that can be repeated. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen, but we can, we can do the experiment over and over um, to produce results. Sample space is another key term that we need to know, and it's usually represented with a capital S. Um, and all that is is the collection of all the possible outcomes. So for example, if we roll a die, um, then all the possible outcomes are that die landing on a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6. So those are all the possible outcomes. An event, which again we um, typically denote with a capital E, is any collection of outcomes from a probability experiment. For example, if we roll a 4, that is an event. Okay, so when we roll a die, each of those outcomes is an event. Um, and a simple event has only one outcome. Now we have something called the law of large numbers, and basically what that means is that the more you conduct this experiment, um, the closer and closer your probability becomes um, to the theoretical or empirical probability. So for example, if we flip a coin, which is what this graphic is showing, if we flip a coin, and say it land, and we're looking at um, the probability that it'll land on heads. And so we flip it the first time here, and it lands on heads. And then we flip it again, and it maybe lands on tails, or keep flipping and flipping and flipping. And, and as we progress, it will get closer and closer to 50%. So the more um, times you run the experiment, the closer your probability gets to that theoretical probability or the actual um, what the probability will be um, closest to. All right, so we have some rules of probability. Now, whenever we find the probability of an event, remember that that capital E stands for the event, and so this P of E, that's the probability of this event occurring, it has to be between one, zero and one. You can't have a probability less than zero you can have a probability that's equal to zero. That just means it, it will not, it cannot occur. Um, and then you can't have a probability of greater than one. Okay, it can equal one. You can be 100% sure that that's going to happen. Um, but it has to be in between zero and one. Um, and then also all the probabilities of all the possible outcomes must add up to one. Okay. All right, so a probability model is just a list of all the possible outcomes and each outcome's probability. It's impossible when the probability of an event is equal to zero, and it's certain when the probability of an event is equal to one. And then we consider something to be unusual when it has a low probability of occurring. Now, often we use less than 0 0.05, um, but keep in mind that that's not set in stone. Um, there are some circumstances where we would not even want a probability um, that's that's less than that. We would want it to be even smaller. For example, um, capital punishment. Um, we wouldn't want to sentence someone to death if there's a 3% chance that they actually are innocent. Um, so in this case, unusual is really, it depends on the what, you're, what it is that you're studying. Um, and that, that will tell you, you know, if you want to consider it to be unusual or not.
All right, so let's take a look at an example and see how we can how we can use this information. So in a fun size pack of M&M candy, there are five red, six blue, three yellow, three orange, four green, and six brown. Create a probability model using this information. All right, so we're going to use relative frequencies for the probabilities. So here's our probability. Again, we just took the relative frequencies to find each of our probabilities. All the probabilities are between 0 and 1, so it satisfies that condition. And then if we add them all together, they do add up to 1. So this is a probability model. If they didn't all add up to 1, it would not be a probability model. Um, now we could say purple is impossible because there's a 0% chance that um, a purple would occur. Um, none of them are unusual. They all have at least an 11% chance of occurring. All right, so now we're going to take a look at the classical method. Um, and that is uh, basically the relative frequency. Okay, so we're looking at the probability of this event, E. And we're, so we're looking at the number of ways that the event can occur over the number of possible outcomes. It can also be written as this. P of E equals N of E, the number of, of event, and then number of um, sample space. So N of E is the number of outcomes in E, and N of S is the number of outcomes in the sample space. So let's take a look at an example. A pair of fair dice is rolled. Compute the probability of rolling a 6. Compute the probability of rolling a 12. Compare the likelihood of rolling a 6 versus a 12. So the probability of rolling a 6 is 5 out of 36, because there are a total of 36 possible outcomes when you roll two dice. You could get a 5, I'm sorry, you could get a 6 by rolling a 1 and a 5, a 5 and a 1, a 3 and a 3, a 2 and a 4, and a 4 and a 2. The probability of rolling a 12 is just a pair of 6s, so it's 1 out of 36. So rolling a 6 is five times as likely as rolling a 12. In 36 rolls of the dice, we expect to observe about five 6s and one 12. That should say 12, not 2. In a survey of 100 families with two children, 63 of the families had one boy and one girl. Estimate the probability of having one boy and one girl using the empirical method and then compute and interpret the probability of having one boy and one girl using the classical method, assuming boys and girls are equally likely. All right, so, so the empirical method, we have 63 out of the 100. So it's the number um, of occurrences uh, out of the total number. So that's 63%. That's your empirical method. Well, now, we're going to take a look at the classical method. Okay, so the number of ways that you can get one boy and one girl um, would be two. Because if we look at the sample space, you could have a boy and a boy, then you could have a boy and then a girl, then you could have a girl and then a boy, or you could have a girl and a girl. So two out of the total four uh, gives you 50%. So if we repeat the experiment a thousand times and the outcomes are equally likely, expecting a boy or a girl, we would expect 500 trials to result in one boy and one girl. So in this case, the empirical um, method gives us a higher percentage than the classical method. Um, and the classical really could be looked at as the theoretical. So we have something called the subjective probability, and that's um, basically when the probability is obtained on the basis of personal judgment. For example, um, especially in the economy when they're trying to make predictions um, or in weather when they're trying to make predictions, yes, they have uh, data that they can use and they have um, complex computer programs, but there's still an element of personal judgment there. So when an economist predicts that there's a 20% chance of recession next year, that's a subjective probability because they're using not just um, the data that they have, but they're also using personal judgment based on that data. Um, again, weather is another good example of where there's personal judgment 
mixed in with the data that gives um, a subjective probability.